Good morning, Common Ground Church. How we doing? Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to Common Ground Church. Uh, if you are a guest with us this morning, I haven't had the privilege of meeting you. My name is Matt McDonald. I'm the lead pastor here at CGC, which is always the place to be. And that is the end of my rhyming skills, so I'm going to stop before I get myself in trouble. Um, but we are excited that you're with us this morning, church family. We're excited that you're with us this morning. We are in week two uh, of this series that we're calling A Bridge to the World. Um, and if you were here last week, we were giving out free for free 99 t-shirts out in the lobby. So if you got one, congratulations. You don't get two this week. If you weren't here last week, we got some more in the lobby, so stop by. Uh, we're just giving them away until they're gone. Uh, and so uh, just excited to continue on this series um, in this service. You know, at the beginning of 2022, um, as we were praying and kind of asking God, Lord, what do you have for us this year? What are you leading us into? Uh, what do we need to be aware of? What do you want to show us, God? Uh, this word mission kept popping up. Um, th this idea of, of we are to be not just followers of Jesus for ourselves, but followers of Jesus to be on mission to make disciples of all nations throughout the land, starting in this corner of Albuquerque that God has placed us in. So we spent a lot of the year talking about mission. Uh, in this series that we're in, A Bridge to the World, it's really kind of a keying in on what that looks like practically as well for us uh, here at Common Ground Church. That's not me, but pretty family to look at. They're, they're nice to look at. You'll meet him in a second. Um, and so we're excited. Last week we started this series and we talked a little bit about who every nation is. We, we've been talking about that for a while. If you've been here for some time, you know uh, we are an every nation church. And last week, we began to unpack that a little bit. And this week, I'm really excited. We actually have another every nation pastor here, uh, Pastor Clayton, who will bring up in just a second uh, to bring the word. And uh, just, uh, I'm really, really looking forward to it, but wanted to give you a little brief context who Pastor Clayton is, how we met. We actually met um, through uh, means that I was told as a child growing up, you shouldn't meet people on, uh, which was an internet chat room. Um, okay, it was Instagram DMs, but still, it's kind of the same. Now it's become a little bit more acceptable, so, um, but I was at, uh, Pastor Sean and I were at an Every Nation conference last summer. Uh, we got to sit in on a session with Pastor Clayton and his wife Kelly, um, speaking about some things, and there was some things about him. I'm like, I just, I want to meet this guy. One, he's funny. He's, he's, he's easy to talk to, easy to get along with. Um, but the more even we started connecting beyond that, um, there's an authenticity to him uh, that is just very, very engaging. You, you want to be around him. You want to hear him. And so we started talking and through all that convinced him to come take a trip to the beautiful dry heat of New Mexico from the air swampland that is Florida. <laughs> and so um, we've been hanging out with him this weekend, hearing a little bit about him, his family story. Uh, him and his wife Kelly planted uh, Trinity New Life Church in 2009, just north of Tampa. He'll tell you a little bit more um, about that. But, you know, there's a scripture that God was putting on my mind as we were worshiping, and I was, I was just praying for you, uh, Pastor Clayton, Kelly, for your family, for your church. There's a scripture in Matthew 12, uh, 11, that says, the, since the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of God was forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. Um, and it's not this idea of like, I am going to force you to believe Jesus. <laughs> the context for us today um, is it takes a, a pretty strong sense of conviction in what you're doing to not let the throws, the pressures of culture and the world stop you from doing what God has called you to do. Um, and in the, in the short time I've been able to know you guys and talk to you guys, that's just something I believe resonates about you is what God has called you to and how he's called you to be in the midst of it. So um, I'm so excited for us to get to hear from him. Church, would you please stand to your feet? Help me welcome Pastor Clayton Bell to the stage. Well, good morning, everybody. It's, uh, wait till after the message to decide whether you want to stand uh, and apply. Go ahead and have a seat real quick. Um, we have my wife and I, Kelly, you can put that picture up if you want to now. This is my wife, uh, Kelly, uh, and our 14-year-old 5'5 daughter, Caroline, uh, who just started uh, high school. And uh, we have been extremely blessed uh, to be here with you guys. I've tried to do my best to, to I like to, whenever I, I get a chance to come in, which is, I don't actually travel that often, I try to, to do as much as I can to accommodate to the local place, which is why I'm preaching from an iPad, uh, like Pastor Matt, and I wore a jacket. Uh, it's not a blazer. 
It's not a blazer, uh, and I have no sneaker game to speak of. Uh, and so people are like, I, they're white uh, like the. Like, that's all I got uh, right there. Um, just, again, I don't know if you've ever met anybody from Florida. You've probably seen some internet memes about Florida man. Uh, they're all true. Uh, and uh, because Florida and Albuquerque have a very, very close connection. I don't know if you know this or not. Uh, it's meth. Uh, you have <laughs> fictional characters who make it, and we have real people who feed it to alligators. Uh, I have never done or cooked meth. I don't want to talk about selling. No, I'm just kidding. I, uh, my, wi- I, my wife and I were campus ministers at Florida State University. Uh, I was the executive pastor of our church there. I held just about every job that there was to have there. I was not good at all of them. They very quickly moved me on from being the children's pastor and the youth pastor. They're like, no. Uh, and uh, I was like, you just throw goldfish at them and they're fine, right? And they're like, no, well, it's a little more than that. Uh, and uh, we planted, as Pastor Matt said, Trinity New Life Church in 2009 uh, and have been blessed to see that church continue to grow We had the privilege of pastoring that, and it's being taken care of by a wonderful team uh, back home. Uh, And I have the privilege uh, currently serving on Every Nation uh, North America on its North American leadership team. Uh, And so we are extremely blessed to be here. We have loved getting into Lynn. Uh, These are not skinny jeans. I've just been eating with them for two days. Um, (laughs) And I've gotten a chance to, to meet a lot of you who are volunteers yesterday and to meet with your Uh, We had dinner with the staff, and I just want to just tell you right from the very beginning what an incredible blessing uh, all of you have been, just this experience has been to us. It's been a blessing to us, and I I just want to just encourage you and and speak to you a little bit. I I don't know how much you get a chance to, it's one of the things like when you're always, and you love your church, you're always at your church, and then you just kind of think like this is, this is normal, this is how things are, and you don't always get to see it. So let me just tell you from a few things from an outsider's perspective. You have a tremendous amount of faith in your church. It's very palpable. It's very, it's very evident. So if you're like, this is how things are, uh, no, you, you are uniquely marked by the level of faith that you have. Uh, this is, uh, it, from the top down, um, the amount of, of welcoming and serving and hospitality and hosting is unbelievable in the way that you guys all process that. And so I just want to encourage you, encourage you in your servant's heart and how incredible you guys are in that. And I, I, I try to always, uh, I was telling somebody, like, uh, I, when I'm worshiping in my own church, I'm always on the front row, and I, and I'm, I like to sing. So again, Pastor Matt and I, Pastor Matt and I have that in, in account. We'll, we'll just be like, there's times where I've accidentally left my microphone on because we do worship afterwards, and they're like, your, your mic's on. And I'm like, you're welcome. You know, like, I just, <laughs> somebody had to hit the lows. You know, like, you had to. But I like to also sometimes just, like, lean back a little bit. And see where, like I can kind of, at this point I can tell like, fourth row, the worship died at the fourth row. Like that's how far the faith went back. <laughs> and I, in, in both, our, both our, our, our team brunch yesterday and in worship this morning could feel it going all the way to the back of the room. And so I just want to encourage you in that, that there is something special here. And, and that you should be thankful for that. I, I've been praying and asking God to not just for the word here, this is just a little bit of, by ways of introduction, but as, an, as, as a little bit of an encouragement. I, what I really feel like is that you, common ground right now, is like a bow being pulled back. And that there is, because of the faith, because of the service, because of the worship, because of the mission, because of the fun, because of the life, it is all these forces that is pulling a bow back that is going to send you into a greater level of influence and, and, and help into this Albuquerque world around you. I'm telling you, you, you got to get ready for you got to get ready for two more rows there back in the back of the of the service. You you might have to uh, go to one of the most terrifying things anyone has ever said to any pastor, and that is three services. Uh, you, but but people need what you have. There are we've driven by churches, and I'm sure there's a lot of amazing churches here in Albuquerque, but there are people who are uniquely needing what you have because what you have is so valuable and so special. 
And so I want to encourage you to have your eyes open, to have your hearts opened, to be able to consider yourselves common. I am common ground. You are common ground. So that everybody else coming in here is going to be able to get to feel and experience what has made you so unique and special. We talked about this at our team brunch yesterday. They do not have to be personally connected to Pastor Matt or to Pastor Sean or to any of your staff to be able to experience common ground because they are not the keepers and holders and only people who are common ground. Everybody that I'm looking at, everybody who's watching online. You can be common ground. You need to be common ground for what you have to be able to go out to everybody. So I just want to bless you just real with that, just with my, hopefully that's an encouragement to you. Let's pray and let's dive into the word today. Father, I pray that I would be able to communicate your word, not with wise and persuasive words. Father, let me preach this morning with a demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power being what changes us, unifies us, and encourages us and challenges us. Would you use this message to search us and to know our hearts, test us and know our anxious thoughts, point out anything in each of us that offends you so that we might be led along a path of everlasting life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this series that we're in right now, A Bridge to the World, and I say we on purpose because I don't like saying me and I and you. I like we, and we're going to talk about that because we are in a series about spiritual family, about our, our every nation family. What does that mean to be a part of that, the values, the mission? And I'm, I feel like a little bit of the old man in doing that. I've been a part of every nation since 1999, and I'm going to be able to share with you a little bit of kind of my perspective, my history, what I've seen as the, the value and benefits of it. I do want to just kind of dispel any, any fears. Uh, we, we actually are a denomination. That's just an IRS word, though. That's not a, that's not a self-identifying word because I think people get nervous. So they always Google, like I said, how did you find our church? And they Googled non-denominational churches in our area. And I'm like, sorry. And I go, well, usually what you're looking for is, is the pastor going to be wearing jeans? You know, like, there's step one. The other is you're worried. You're worried that there's this, this, this kind of conclave of people in a place that you're never going to meet who are going to tell you how to be the best church in Albuquerque, and you know how to be the best church in Albuquerque. That's how every nation works. Every nation works to be able to say, how can we connect you and serve you, not how can we direct you and tell you. And so we're actually existing, the leadership exists to support, to serve, to bless, and empower the people who know how to do ministry best in their own area. And so I want to answer this question. What benefit is it to common ground to be a part of a global family of churches. That's every nation's way we would describe it. Nobody would say, you're not going to find word denomination, anything like that. You're going to find this phrase, a global family of churches. Has Pastor Matt ever used the word family to describe who you are? Has any, anybody you guys ever described what it means to be family? See, it's, it's one thing. If you call each other a team, teams have free agency. They have roster changes and everything like that. Family, family can be deeper Family can be harder. Family, your expectations change. So it's a good thing to expect to be family, but just know it's harder and more beneficial to be that. What's the value to common ground of being part of a global family of churches? We're going to talk about the value of extra local spiritual family. What does it benefit you to have the value of extra local spiritual family? And you might be thinking, what is this? Why am I getting this message? I... I'm not going to any conference. I'm even here for the first time. What's going on? This is what we're going to talk about. Why does it benefit you? What do you get? Here's the first thing I, I believe that you get, one of the most valuable things that, that you get that I have had as being a part of an extra local spiritual family is that you get a spiritual inheritance. Not just a spiritual blessing, but an inheritance. And we're going to talk about the difference between those two. See, I did not grow up as a Christian. I became a Christian going into college. And I was a good kid in high school with no God. And then I became a Christian going into college. And I did the best thing when you want to serve God in college. What do you do? You join a fraternity. <laughs> Correct to all of you laughing. That is the appropriate response. But if you had said, hey, is what you're doing wrong? I would have been like, I don't, I don't know. I had no framework or idea. What does it mean to serve God? And I... Actually, then by the end of my freshman year, got back together with my girlfriend who was still in high school. It worked out, by the way. Uh, you know, like, she won. No, I don't mean she won me. I just mean, like, I won. I won. We all won, okay? We're all winners here. 
And I was considering actually leaving Florida State because, and going to maybe someplace else because I just I wanted to be around Christians and I didn't know what that meant. I'm living in my fraternity house and it's terrible. And somebody invited me out to this, hear this motivational speaker. And I was like, oh, I can't hear a motivational speaker. I'm a Christian who doesn't go to church or read his Bible or have, you know, like I'm like <laughs> resisting this. And I'm like, no. And they're like, actually, it's a Christian speaker. And I was like, okay, I'll go. And I went and it looked like everybody there was pretty normal, like they could throw a football because most of them were Florida State football players back when we knew how to play football. One of my, a guy who became one of my best friends now is, is, got saved in that meeting. Another one of our pastors in Tallahassee became part of our ministry in that same meeting. And really the thing more than anything was that it looked normal. And I was like, yeah, I want to reach out to my fraternities and the fraternities and sororities. And everybody said, you got to meet this guy named Addison Tweedy. Addison still lives in Nashville. He helps with uh, God's Not Dead events around the world through every nation. He's a campus minister. And his one of his partners, because we don't just have all this money to hire campus ministers, you, if you want to do campus ministry, you go around and you go, will you support me? $50 a month. Will you support me? $50. And you keep doing that until you have half of a salary and you just live off of ramen. No, you're supposed to. <laughs> but one of Addison's partners didn't use money. He owned a Western Sizzler and he just gave him coupons for Western Sizzler. So all of Addison's discipleship meetings were at Western Sizzler. And as a college kid, you're like, I don't care if this is real food or just a bunch of chemicals together. It's delicious, and there's never-ending supply of it. <laughs> and I sit there with Addison over a plate of what something, someone called ribs, and he explains discipleship to me. That if you take what you have and you invest in somebody else and share that with them, and then they learn to go and do that same thing with other people, and they learn to go and do that same thing with other people, we can actually see the world one to Christ way faster than if we just had meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. And I just was like, this is the greatest plan ever. Do other people know about this? This guy has just come up with the greatest plan ever. We should go tell people about it. I didn't know anything about discipleship. I didn't know anything about being invested in and then going to invest in others, about being trained and then going and training others. This is how the Apostle Paul describes discipleship to his spiritual son, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter, one, I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 1. He says, Timothy, my dear son, be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. So why do, you, why do you disciple? Why do you share your faith? Because of what Christ Jesus has done in you. So you have heard me teach things that have been given to you, Timothy, that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now I want you to teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to other things. Paul, to Timothy, to reliable men, to trustworthy others. Paul to Timothy, to reliable men, to others. You know, you are somewhere in that path. You're probably, you might be others right now. You're just getting the gospel into your life. Others of you might be the reliable people who have had the gospel a little bit and have started to invite your friends. Some of you might be the Timothys. Some of you might be the Pauls, who are four spiritual generations ahead of somebody else. Do you know that a lot of the people that we're talking about in there, they're not the ones here yet. And you know, five years ago, how many of you weren't here either? But some Paul, some Timothy, some reliable person, some trustworthy others took the gospel, took what they received, and decided not to keep it but to make sure that they handed it on to somebody else. See, Paul talks, because Paul says these things, these truths, what is that? I want to go over this real quick. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. He's talking about what do we pass on? We're not passing on common ground, though common ground is a good thing. We're passing on the gospel. Because God saved us. He called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was his plan before the beginning of time. To show his grace through Christ Jesus. And now he has made all of this plain to us by the appearing of Christ Jesus, our Savior. He broke the power of death, illuminated the way to life and immortality through the good news 
And God has chosen me to be a preacher, an apostle, and a teacher of the good news. The thing that you're going to pass on, Paul, to Timothy, to reliable men, to other people, is not just that you love your church. It's not that you love serving. All that comes as a result of what Jesus has done in your life. Everything about who we are and who we sustain, everything that we want to proclaim is about how we were dead in our trespasses and sins, and Jesus Christ alone rescued us through his life, death, and resurrection. There is no one else who saves us. No one else who sets us free. So it's not going to be tradition. It's not going to be assumption. If there's anything that we have worth passing on to someone else, it is the hope and salvation of Jesus Christ who has set us free from sin and death. If you got yourself right, can you come talk to me afterwards because you got to help me get right. Because I need, I am in desperate need of Jesus every day of my life. And so we have something to pass on. So instead of revival being my goal, discipleship was my goal. And I've been using my life ever since to tell other people about this. To go and to make disciples. Not to go to events. Not to make converts. We planted the church in 2009 and we started, I started going to like every, you read everything you can about church planting. And you go to every church conference there was. And the largest church planting conference in America is called Exponential, and it's about an hour and a half from my house in Orlando. So I go, and it's like 6,000 pastors and potential church planters at this. It's like you ever, you go to like a concert in a stadium, and like there's like uh, the line at the women's restroom like goes around the whole, you know, block, and then the men are like, we're good, you know, like, <laughs> but you go to like a church planting conference like that, and it's like, you know, RIP to the men's restroom, you know, like, and the women are like, finally, but not encouraged, you know, like, <laughs> and they're up there, and five thousand, all these church leaders, there you go, some of you are getting that one, you know, like, and they're going, Here's what we think God is saying to the next generation. Focus on discipleship. And they were saying it in a way that they weren't sure how to even pronounce the word. It was so new to them. It's like Sean's trying to teach me, like, no, 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 the two L's is a Y sound. You know, like, <laughs> what did we have for dessert last night? Pampalililos? So, sopa pibia, sopa yio. You know, like, you know, like. But that's like how they were saying discipleship, which was like, disciple she, you know, like, and I was like, discipleship, you know, it was like they were, they were just discovering it. And I'm kind of looking around like, are you just discovering discipleship? I've had discipleship this whole time, but I really hadn't. I didn't grow up going to church. I didn't grow up with, an with discipleship. I was handed an inheritance of discipleship. I never had to go through a discovery. Should we be attractional or missional? Should we be an incarnate community? I never had to worry about any of these terms because Addison handed me a legacy and an inheritance of discipleship because he had gotten it from Rice Brooks, from Steve Merle, and from Phil Benasso, the founders of every nation. Thank God that he spoke to them in that way. Because as I looked around to other churches, and they're struggling to even embrace the value of discipleship, let alone figure out how it was, I didn't go through that, not because I was good or smart or worthy, but because of the value of an extra local global spiritual family, I had received an inheritance for which I had not worked or earned, but I was incredibly grateful and blessed for and I knew that the gospel, the gospel was not a trophy to hold up and go, look what God did in my life. The gospel was a baton. You may not know it to look at me, but back in middle school, I was on the 4 by 100 team. Just, <laughs> you just had to be tall at that point, and your legs were longer than everybody else's. Boys in middle school are either this tall or this tall. You know, like it's a, I love middle school. It's like, hey, everybody who's unfinished, let's just put you all together and create the group. <laughs> Like, who looks back at middle school and is like, I was killing it in middle school. You know, like, no. Everybody hates middle school. 43 years old, I'm still talking about the trauma of middle school. You know, like, it's great. And I ran the 4 by 100 and you receive the baton, and then you pass the baton on. The gospel is not a trophy for you to hold up. The gospel is a baton 
for you to, try, for you to hand off. A baton of the gospel, of discipleship, the value and inheritance of discipleship was handed to me because it was handed to them by somebody else. Pastor Matt and Caitlin, they have been handed a baton of Common Ground Church, but don't you hope that Common Ground Church won't always be pastored by Pastor Matt because it's going to live on past him? Like, I started this church. I hope that I am not the only pastor of Trinity New Life Church. I hope that at some point there is a baton for me to be handed off to someone of a spiritual inheritance. And so here's how we say it at my church. We exist to make disciples who change the world. That's the baton that we have. Here's how you say it. We are a family of individuals that have found hope in Jesus and simply want as many people as possible to experience that exact same freedom. Amen. That's right. Come on. Different language, same heart. Different language, same heart. This beautiful, wonderful inheritance that we have as the second generation of every nation leaders of spiritual family and campus ministry and leadership development and lordship and church planning. But in my 20 years of ministry and almost 24 years of being a part of every nation, I don't know that I have ever found a spiritual inheritance that I have valued to receive more than the centrality, focus, and emphasis on discipleship. Do you know that, do you know that that actually will keep your church a little smaller? I have one of my friends, one of my elders, I'm an elder, he's like, you know the way you preach inherently limits the size of your church? And I was like, tell me more. <laughs> he goes, well, you ask people to believe. You ask people to move it. So I, I don't know if this is your, your first time, and if not, I'm mean. Pastor Matt's nice. But the expectation is that wherever you are, you don't stay there. you got to get closer to Jesus. Well, I think I'm fine where I am. Well, I think you're wrong. And, you know, like, and I think I'm not where I need to be. You're not going to, like, there's no, like, ding on, like, you know, the oven. Ding! you know, cookies are ready, you know, like, take my soul out of the oven, I'm done. Like, like no, if, you, if this is your first Sunday trying to even hear about the word Jesus, you have got to become more like him. And if this is your 50th year of hearing about Jesus, guess what? You have got to become more like Jesus. And, there, and this is not about other churches. I'm not talking about other churches. I'm talking about the way that some people consider spirituality is that spirituality exists to be able to create a little bit of an emotional upper and an emotional hit that they can get and so that they can then go on throughout the week and then they eventually decline and they get back to Sunday and they get their hit of spiritual and emotionality and they're up and then they go down from there. And you know what? At Common Ground, that's not the way that you're going to be encouraged to follow Jesus. You're going to be like, hey, Stop coming here on Sunday and doing this and then going out to lunch and then giving like your server like a 5% tip. Especially if you're wearing one of those black common ground shirts or like a bridge to the world. Yeah. You're going to do that. Wear, wear, like, wear another church's shirt. That's what I do. Whenever I, I like to intentionally wear, like I'm going to wear my common ground shirt on the way home from the, on the plane. Like I promise I'm going to be like very nice to the stewardesses, you know, like, what's your name? Matt. My name's Matt. You know, like. Such a jerk. <laughs> and people are going to be like, why are you pushing me so much? Because the grace is sufficient for you. Because the grace is real for you. And I am so thankful for a global spiritual family because I didn't come up with any of that. It was all handed to me as a baton. And I have to make sure that I'm looking to the next generation, both age-wise and spirituality, of the next thing. So the, the benefit of common ground being a part of a global family of churches is a spiritual inheritance of discipleship. Next thing, it's a spiritual inheritance of brothers and sisters. Every nation now has a seminary. Uh, I'm trying to talk Pastor Matt into, uh, into joining it with me. Uh, it's a legit seminary. It's not just like us getting around and like, high five, you're great. You know, like we have to, we have to read a lot. We have to read, and not all the books are exciting. I can, I can encourage you in that. And, but every year we do two weeks together, learning together, coming together, and it's in Manila. Uh, and we'd meet every day, twice a day in chapel, and we would pray for the nations. In my cohort alone, the people who are doing it with me, I have 14 different nations represented. 
So there's about 30-something people, but about 14 different nations of ministry. I've never done so much Googling of where certain countries are in Asia. You know, I'm like, okay, Singapore, Singapore is, that's next to, okay, got it. And then, and I'm just like, just my mind is being blown. I mean, like we'd, ha- we'd hear about the nation, they'd give us some prayer points, they would pray in their own language, and then we would just pray for that nation. One of the days I'm, I'm in chapel, and immediately the scripture comes to mind. Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. It cuts between soul, spirit, joint, and marrow. Exposes our innermost thoughts. The word of God is alive and powerful. And as I looked around this room in Manila with all these different nations, I realized that the word of God was alive and active. In me in Florida, the word of God is alive in you in New Mexico. It's alive in Suiji, the campus minister in Singapore. It's alive in David from India. It's alive in Mark from South Africa. It's alive in Yelmer from Belgium. And it was showing me just how alive and powerful the word is. I, had, I, I was understanding the word of God. I was understanding Jesus himself better Because I was seeing people who were not like me serve the same God as me. And I went, oh, the word looks like that. The word is alive in her. The word is alive in him. The word is alive in this country. And if the word is alive there, that means God is there. And that means there's a part of God that I need to understand in in those places. People who don't look like me, people who don't speak like me, people who don't minister exactly like me. And the word of God was alive in them and was powerful in them. Because what's a benefit to common ground to be part of a global family of churches? Brothers and sisters who are so different than you, you will get to see the word of God come alive in ways that you never would have just if you were able to do so from Albuquerque. Even with all the diversity that you have and all of the, so many people talked about yesterday the value of how great it is, how multi-generational you were. You know, you hear the word of God, when you hear it come out of a teenager's mouth and you hear it come out of an octogenarian's mouth, you start getting a broader, more full version of what the word of God looks like. When I was in Tallahassee as a campus minister, we had eight people who would eventually become senior pastors. Lots of opinions. And everyone's voice sharpened me made me see things in a different way, made me consider them in ways I had never done before. The Word of God becomes alive and active in a different way, and you understand a little bit differently when Pastor Shad's up here preaching to you, when Pastor Daryl's up there preaching to you, when Kevin York comes here, when I hear from the pastors in my life, my peers of Adam Mabry and Seth Trimmer and Adrian Crawford, you guys just finished up a series called From, uh, what was it, uh, from the, for, uh, By the People, For the People. Incredible. When you heard these folks stand up here and speak, you didn't get a new Bible, you didn't get a new God, but you started getting a more multicolored, multifaceted, multidimensional, multi-age version of God. It, It brings the word more alive in your soul. They have been through things, seen things, been places, shared with people you never have. And now you get to understand even more of that part of God. So everybody here is saying that my perspective is dumb and stupid and worthless. I am too young and I am too old and I am too good looking. Like I understand, you know, like, like, no, it's not. There is a way that God is speaking to you that is going to help other people discover other parts of God. It's not that you don't have the living God really inside of you already, but it's that you get a more clear, more colorful, more incredible perspective. You know, in Genesis 1, uh, God says we're going to make people in our our image. And then in Exodus 20, God tells them not to make idols. Okay, so what's the connection between those two things? The way humans worship gods is they create a place, mostly called a temple, and they fill it with physical carvings of what they think their God looks like so that it's a little easier to worship what you can actually see. And the reason our God doesn't want us to do that is that he has already created a place for him to dwell. His temple is the whole world. And he has already created idols. 
In Exodus 20, that word right there that says, don't make idols, is very close to the same word for image. The reason God does not want you to carve out little things or make little idols of things so that it's easier for you to worship is that he has already carved out idols of what he looks like to make it easier for you to worship. So you don't need to look at a little statue or a painting of Jesus as uh, 2,000 years ago, Arab, uh, you know, a Jewish man in, in Jerusalem somehow looking like a white, blonde-haired, blue-eyed guy with, with conditioned hair well beyond the hair products available of the era. If I could just, people say all the time, if I could just see what Jesus looks like, it would make me easier, it would make it easier for him to worship. As if you have not already seen the image of God in the world around you. This room is full of the idols of God, the images of God. And when you look around this room, that's going to make it easier to worship. Because God looks like all these different colors, ages, all these different people. And so the value of this global spiritual family, that's okay. The value of the global spiritual family is that you get brothers and sisters, cousins, aunts and uncles who bring the word of God more alive, more multicolored, more real, more international, with different accents. And God is there, the Holy Spirit is there in all of them. You get a spiritual inheritance of discipleship, you get brothers and sisters, and my last one, you get a multiplied mission. You get a multiplied mission. Every nation, as Pastor Matt was, he said this a couple times last week, every nation says we exist to honor God by establishing Christ-centered, spirit-empowered, and socially responsible churches in every nation and campus ministry, uh, campus, churches and campus ministries in every nation. And you go, every nation? That's, that's, that's a lot of nations, by the way. I don't know if you know this. It's a lot of nations. Did you know that you are already starting to do that? You're already starting to do that. Whenever you give to Common Ground, and Common Ground gives 10% to every nation, every nation in North America immediately takes that and splits that off. Every nation in North America, which is our kind of central offices and not, not really much stuff, they keep it pretty slim, only runs on 5% of all of the church's giving. Most denominations run on 10%. We take that other 5% and use it internationally to support church planning and ministries in places that could never do so on their own. So if you have given to Common Ground, you have given to church planning efforts in China, in underground churches in Iraq, in Iran, in Kuwait, in the United Arab Emirates, in all of these places. Let me tell you something. You can have an impact around the world in your praying, your giving, and your going through the testimony, and through your participation in every nation. It will multiply the mission here by thinking about it. You go, well, if we give to that, it's going to mean less here. If we go there, won't it mean less of our attention here? That's just not the way the economy of God seems to ever work. Amen. It's like how the blood of the martyrs seems to launch revival rather than tamp things down. Paul gives the Thessalonians an encouragement that I want to share with you, and I want you to hear this encouragement as well. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, he said, You received the message with joy from the Holy Spirit in spite of the severe suffering it brought you. In this way, you both imitated us and the Lord. As a result, you have become an example to all the believers in Greece throughout both Macedonia and Achaia. And now the word of God is ringing out, the word of the Lord is ringing out from you to all people everywhere, even beyond Macedonia and Achaia. For wherever we go, we find people telling us about your faith in God. We don't need to tell them about it, for they keep talking about it. And the wonderful welcome you gave us and how you turned away from idols to serve the living God. I promise you will see a greater impact in Albuquerque through common ground when common ground is not just concerned about Albuquerque. When I go back to Florida, I will tell testimony of the faith and worship of common ground. Not because of what you did for me, but because of what I experienced needs to be told to other people to encourage other people. I think one of the most encouraging things to Kelly and I has been like, oh, this is, this is an easy hang. Easy hang. We immediately connected. Oh, this is spirit. This is, yes, 
this relationship began by Pastor Matt sliding into my DMs. You know, like, yeah, you know, like, again, kids, teens in here, do not, do not, don't do what your pastor did, just listen to your pastor. <laughs> But I'm going to tell testimony of that, and that's going to encourage other people. I'm going to tell testimony of your rock star pastors, of, of your worship, of your service. And that's going to encourage other people. Oh, there are other, oh, there are every, oh, okay. And then when you send missions trips, when you go to these things and you hear like, hey, here's what's happened in China. Oh, oh, that, that builds your faith up. Oh, look what we are participating in. You'll wonder at first, like, wait, campus ministry? Church planning around the world, why are we praying for this? Why are we giving to this? Why are we going to this? I've seen the hearts and hopes of our people, their faith and their testimony, only grow when they learn to be on the greater global mission of God. It has only grown, it has only increased for their local context as they take on the burden of the global mission of God as well. What benefit is it to common ground to be part of a global family of churches, a spiritual inheritance of discipleship, a, mo a, a, a family, a spiritual family of brothers and sisters who make the word come alive in a greater way, and a multiplied mission that common ground goes beyond its borders and will make, that will actually make common ground much more blessed than it is there. I am extremely thankful that this church is a part of every nation. I am extremely thankful for your pastors, your leaders, and you, your faith, your worship, your generosity, your hope, your mission. It blesses me, and I want to pray to be able to bless you, to encourage you as we close this morning. God, thank you for this wonderful church. From the person who is leading at the top, the person who is leading in the shadows, the person opening the door, and the person just trying to find their way to connect with this family. They are all common ground. God, you have placed a grace of joy and faith on this church. God, I pray for the people who are hungry for that. They will be satisfied. The people thirsty for the way the water is here would be able to find it. God, would you continue to increase this church so that the gospel may increase, so that salvations will increase. So the water baptism list in a couple weeks is too filled, Lord Jesus, and we need another one. I thank you for what is here. And as they continue to pursue you, passionately consumed by you, God, would you allow their light to shine to the world around them. In Jesus' name.